official HA presentation, so some of the stuff in here is more from my side uh, about transitioning from an athlete into a coach. Uh, certain things in there are, are themes that the national program do work on. There's certain things that uh, yeah, I work on with uh, guys in Queensland. Uh, so I sort of want to quickly jump through. I don't want to have us here too long and then lose interest as well. So just really just from me transitioning from uh, athlete to coach, you know, as a player, getting the taste, and what keeps me uh, motivated. I guess it's the, the motivation of wanting to, to still be involved in, in some way and at some time and point uh, with the national program um, and going to the big major events. Uh, obviously, going to the Olympics, it's fantastic. This one's going to be hard watching the guys on TV when you, you'd love to be there and still be involved in it. Uh, I know Jay is the same, he tries to go, he's been to every Olympics since he's uh, finished playing. Um, can't get enough of me, not going to mate, so. Brilliant. Uh, what? Uh, <laughs> stop on that. <laughs> um, yeah, I've learned about how dealing with disappointment, that non selection and injury. So I went through that as a player, you now have to deal with that as a coach. And, uh, and dealing with players that get injured. Um, young Queensland, one of our best players, uh, last week got injured and um, couldn't make it down to the 21s. And dealing with a guy that was uh, pretty emotional. Um, it was probably two days before he left, uh, so I sort of had to learn how to deal with that, you know, coaching through that. Um, uh, the desire to be part of what I said, you know, not wanting to miss anything, wanting to be there and be part of it, that's what sort of motivates me, keeps me going. Uh, so whether it be Olympic Games, Kong Games, World Cups, Champions, Trophies. Um, you learn about frustrations around the selections and trainings. You know, the big question of why, why did the coaches do this? Why did Barry Dancer do so many different things, you know? Um, why was there always so many changes in the team? Why did we go away with different players all the time? It's probably not until I became a coach, so I understood it a lot more about how he developed uh, a playing group and a squad of athletes. Uh, always doing the same drills of training, getting bored of training. Uh, you sort of learn from that. Do I do the same? No, I'm very different. I think every training and session I do, you do a different, different drills from the previous training. It's totally different all the time. Um, and now have a better understanding of why coaches did uh, certain things. Regrets, yeah, I do have a lot of regrets now when you look at the game and the trends of the game, the way the game's moved, uh, how much faster it's become, uh, how much fitter the guys have become. Um, certainly regrets of not applying myself when I had the opportunity. And mainly because I didn't realise how good it was to be an athlete and be involved at the time. Um, until you finish retiring, you become unfit. Uh, yeah, no motivation to go for a run now, or no motivation to do anything related to fitness. Um, it's quite tough. So you actually don't realise how good your life is as an athlete and uh, how good that time um, time was. Uh, moving to coaching, um, I find that players seem to think they know everything, um, and no matter what what you give to them, they've always got an answer to come back, and they've always got a but. What if you do this? But but this? But that? Um, so the first thing I need to do is I say, not as I do or, or slash did, because uh, I was one of those players that knew everything, always had a had an answer for everything, um, and I sort of look back now and reflect as a coach, you know, I must have been a pain in the ass, I reckon, as a player at different times in my career. Um, so you can sort of relate to a lot of those um, when you get this. <laughs> oh, that's right. Um, so moving into the coaching was having a head full of knowledge, but how do you get that out? I figured that it was going to be pretty easy walking into a coaching job. This is going to be great. And you go out the field with an elite bunch of guys that have done all the basic stuff. We'll be able to go into some more uh, technical stuff and you know, bigger drills and uh, air sweep. And uh, that really backfired in the first six months. And I guess now I've gone back to simply the basic stuff. So a lot of the information that we come up tonight is just going to be stuff. Nothing you haven't already heard. Uh, but I find that the basic stuff is often is what we've got to get right um, as athletes coming through. Um, that one about uh, keeping up with game development. Um, the game's changed, like I said, it's a lot faster than the Australian style. Rick's, Rick's brought in a different style of the game. Um, it's a lot more high pace, a lot more um, expected of the athletes. Uh, so we'll go through a bit about the structures, um, all the different names and positions and that, what they call them, as opposed to the old days, the old school. Um, but yeah, new skill sets as well. Uh, the players and coaching the players that I've played with has been quite difficult. Um, 
I guess managing that from an IHL point of view, and there was six guys there that went to the Olympics with, and it's quite difficult trying to grab them and say, no, you're not doing this right, you've got to do this. Uh, it's actually about how to become really a manager of athletes, not so much a coach and telling them what to do, it's managing players um, when you've got them out on the park. Uh, a big theme in Queensland moments of resilience. Now it's resilience with the players, the playing group. Um, find the guys are pretty soft, they don't know how to push themselves. Uh, they think they're, they're working hard when, when really they're not. Um, but it's also about resilience as a coach as well. About being able to persevere and keep pushing, uh, pushing on with, uh, with things that you're working on. It's uh, persevering with athletes. It's quite easy to look at a guy and say, uh, you know, he's bloody hopeless, get rid of him, you're gone. Um, when in fact, persevere and give them more time, um, they can develop into some really good hockey players. Um, and then just wanting to get better, wanting to get better as a play, uh, player, but as a coach, wanting the players to get better, wanting to see the players succeed and go to the next level. Uh, it's really important. So the key is for attention. Um, now then, again, this is more from my point of view, from a, from a Queensland point of view, the moment we're working with the guys, but I think you find across the board, if you're watching the 21s, it's probably been a little bit disappointing the skill level of a lot of the teams. And I've only been here for a day, so that was yesterday. Um, but the essential is basic skills. So we talk about first touches, you know, and it's really much about how we control the ball with our first touch. You see a lot of guys here that are really struggling with getting the ball on the stick in the first touch. It hits the stick, bounces away, bounces up in the air, they've got to go and regather it. And it takes that extra second, half a second, but that's another five metres an opposition defender can close them down, put you under the pump. It also prevents you from being able to make your next pass quite quickly. Uh, so that's a key thing. And the second one there is about, um, I say hitting and risk passing, but just passing in general. The ability to be able to pass a nice flat ball to your teammate where he wants it. You know, not too far in front of him, not bouncing. Um, something we really struggle with, Queensland guys in particular. Uh, the amount of work we're doing, it obviously showing we're not doing enough work. Uh, we need to work hard. But to me, it's those first, first two things are pretty critical to the game because uh, if you can't do those first two things, then you're not going to worry about anything else because it's just not going to happen. Um, that one is about carrying the ball in a, in a correct position, strong correct position. Um, one of my correct position, uh, maybe not the words put in there, but the amount of times you see guys receive the ball, girls have received the ball on their four stick and their first movement is to move the ball across to their left foot and put it out on the reverse. They put them in themselves in a position where they're really limited to where they can go. They can only really go left. They need to give a quick pass to the right, they're not going to be able to do it, they're going to have to have the extra touch to bring it across to the right before they can make the pass. So the ability of the guys to get the ball out of their four stick, but out on their right foot, so when they can, it's out in front of them, they can then pass either left or right. They can move the ball to the left, they can then move the ball to the right. They're a bit limited when the ball goes over onto their left foot straight away. Uh, tackling has become quite a big one, uh, I find, with, with young guys, um, particularly with their engagement lines, their pressure on the ball, okay, and staying in the contest. The uh, amount of times that we've got to work with the guys um, in, in a Queensland environment, uh, tackling, uh, working on, on those three things, um, it's, it's every session, there's something in every session about tackling. But the biggest thing I'm struggling with is transfer from a training environment into a game. So you can train with them, you can do it over and over again, but then take it into the game and they go back to their old ways. I don't know if you can answer that one today, I don't have the same problem with that. The boys in Victoria. Um, so that's something I'm working on, in particular with the tackling. Um, the other stuff that don't seem to be as bad with. Um, when we talk about engaging lines, engaging lines is. Uh, uh, I guess the body position when you're meeting the, your opponent with the ball. Uh, we don't want people meeting them front on. Um, it's about engaging them where you're actually trying to channel the uh, opposition player where you want. Uh, so as a defender, you're dictating the play to the defender as uh, the opposition attacker, okay? not vice versa. Often you find a lot of players, they go to tackle someone and they think, oh yeah, I'm just going to follow this guy wherever he goes, I'm going to have to react to that. Whereas you actually want to dictate to the attacker what you want to do with it. Um, Off-ball knowledge, um, we'll touch a bit on uh, the structure of the 3-2, 3-2, 3-2, 3, two, three, two, three, 
three or three two three three was it three two three two and read it three two two three four three two etc all the different structures um, so I'll just check something yeah so the next bit um, about roles and responsibilities in pressing and outletting um, with and without the ball uh, the decision making of the players what pass to make what position to get to so this is all when they haven't got the ball Okay, and then second play, second phase players, knowing your next pass before you get it. So I think part of the problem with a lot of players is they'll receive a ball, then they start looking for what the next pass is. They start looking where they're going to go next. But it's too late. At, at, a, at a national level, national championship level, you haven't got that much time on the ball. You need to know what you're going to do with it before you get it. Well, I have a fair idea. Uh, interchange is another one. About how the amount of interchanges that are being made. Uh, I don't know if you know, there's a stat on how many interchanges the Aussie guys make in a game. Uh, a lot, yeah. So, for instance, interchanges, you've got the line rotations. Um, some are on about three minutes, some are on four minutes, depending if you're a striker, or attacking midfielder, or a defender. Um, so add that up over a game. Guys are coming on and off. The longest they spend off the field is about three minutes, I think. Between three and five minutes. So the guys are coming on and off all the time. And the whole idea is to keep it at a high tempo, a high speed. So they come off, you have your break, you go back out there, repeat your efforts again. You go hard, you come off and have a break. So again, with all these things that we're doing in our state environments, we're trying to keep it in line with the national program. We're trying to follow suit so that you know, our guys are developing in line with what the national program is working on. So I guess from an identification process that they can see, yep, they're, they're able to do this. So interchange has become a skill uh, in itself, being able to get on and off the field quickly. How you get from one side of the field to the other is, uh, is a skill that they're being assessed on. The other thing that areas of attention, uh, I work with the guys, is the history of hockey. History of Australian hockey, history of state hockey, and history of your club hockey. So how many of you do you think you can go to, go to your clubs, uh, particularly with the juniors coming through, the, whether they're junior state, uh, guys or girls, how many of them could name the National Olympic team currently? I'd like to throw it out to some of these QAS guys out here that they wouldn't have a clue. If I asked them, well, whose position are you chasing? They wouldn't know. They'd only throw me a couple of Queensland guys' names, not guys they know. Um, which is somewhat disappointing with, with the way, uh, I guess, the generations come through. And again, I said on the other about Gen Y, dealing with Gen Y athletes is, is quite difficult. So I find that they want everything now and they don't want to work hard for it. If they don't get what they want now, then they're happy just to walk away and go and do something else. Uh, there's, I reckon there's a bit of passion there for the sport and a bit of drive and motivation uh, within uh, athletes now uh, coming through. Uh, is there any questions so far? Has anyone, anyone got any <coughs> questions you want to throw out there? Okay, so I just want to move on with the ball, we're talking about with the ball and without the ball. These are probably just the last last two areas we want to look at, and then we're going to have to show a couple of clips at the end of it. Um, so when we talk about with the ball, I sort of talk to guys about with the ball and talk about um, out there. Yeah, there's so many other aspects to with the ball, whether you're up the field or whatever, but I talk with the ball, out there, how you're coming out of the back. Um, so when we talk about structures coming out of defence, you know, back in the old days you had four defenders, you had two right half, left half, two full backs, you had a centre half, left in a right in, right wing, left wing, centre forward. That's how I grew up, how I understood hockey, all the way through, pretty much through under like, 21s and then getting into even into AHL in the younger days before it sort of started changing. There's no such thing as left and right anymore. Um, you're either a defender, you're a defensive midfielder. You're an attacking midfielder, or you're a striker, or you're a combination of all of three, or two of those lines. You've got to have the ability to be go left and right. Um, does everyone understand when we talk about structures three, two, three, two? So it's on the board. You talk about it at the back if you've got your keeper and you're playing three at the back, three, two defensive midfielders. You might have three. Attacking midfielders, you have two strikers up front. You might take that out, you might play with three strikers up front. So 
Some might take that and go four at the back. A three three. They want. You can move it around however you want. There's no set set ways. I know Rick. Rick first in the paper was more like a three three two three two. I know he plays around with the Christmas tree now. Sometimes four four three two one. Um, again, it's when do they when do they go to that that formation? When do you go to that structure? Uh, I work with the guys trying to keep it pretty simple so it's not too complicated uh, because of the athletes that I'm working with and we work with uh, our outletting um, and we get into those into those structures whether we're playing four at the back, three at the back. Um, so I do mix it up, sometimes it's three at the back, I have two defensive midfielders in front, like two centre halves. Okay, I might have two insides and then three strikers still. Sometimes I'll have three insides and you know, I don't need two strikers. So Again, it depends on the opposition you're playing. Um, depends on the best way that your, your team is playing and what best suits your team as well. So there's no right or wrong uh, way to do it. I guess it's just being able to adapt and be able to play different uh, different structures. Uh, positional names, like I said, have changed. So we have a good tool. Yep, sorry. Do you vary it during the game? Do you have your structure at the beginning and do you vary that structure during the game? Um, it depends on the game. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes we've had to do that. We've had to make, uh, make changes. Uh, you certainly make changes if you have someone sent off, whether it be even a green card. But depending on the game and the way it's going, then, yeah, you might have to make a change. Um, so I like to be quite attacking and I like to play with three at the back. Uh, but it may be a time in the game where your team's really struggling and you might need to close the defence a little bit and you need to bring somebody else back out into defence. Um, so you might sort of pull some guys back through the lines to try and get a bit more control. Um, again, that's a personal preference, I guess, to how you want to play. It depends on the opposition. Can't say too much because when we play Jay, we do something different. Can't <laughs> 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 gonna play too much. It's good. Hey, hey you're working. <laughs> we did something different, different, different each year. Um, I think the thing with the with the different structures is that you're building a flexibility within the group, both individuals and, and collectively as a unit. So then you have the ability to um, target certain opposition players, certain opposition structures and things like that. So if you're not so much, structures tend to change in a national championship or, or whatever, but everyone's sort of within the, within the one network. So there's a lot of similarities, but for an international team, um, Obviously, a lot of uh, countries play a different style, so it's uh, it really pays to have that flexibility, um, and I think that's the main reason for it. As with the individuals as well, Wellesley said um, about you know being able to play different lines and things like that. And towards the end of the you know the selection part for the Olympic team this year, I'm sure that would have come down to how many players could play across different lines and through different positions because. Obviously at the Olympics you've only got 16 players and there's only one keeper and if anything goes wrong, whatever, yes, you can bring an athlete in, into the team from your 17 and 18, but really you need that flexibility within your group. And I think that's what the bike's designed. Uh, the next thing on there is about priority of options. Um, so with, with the ball coming out of the back, about being able to prioritise options. Um, so to me, penetration is the key. Okay, if you're out here watching the 21s, you watch Queensland, you'll be thinking, geez, they're really struggling coming out of the back. And you're right, they really are. And uh, there's no penetration coming out of the back, they're missing opportunities to go forward. Um, but when I look at the players, I think the players don't prioritise their options when they're looking, when they come out. They're quite content to go to the safety ball, which is sideways. And often find there's always going to be a safety ball there. Um, but we're trying to work on prioritising where they need to look at first. If they can hit a centre striker or a striker, that's the ball I want them to give. Um, but it's got to be done quite you know, quickly. Um, so the same way to do a quick play to get the ball going. The longer you take, the quicker that option's going to be shut down. Okay, so I'm working on the defender saying, well, who do you look at first? Um, so a bit of technology that we've been using is the guys that have um, looked a bit dicky wearing glasses with a camera. And I put it on just before they've come away, we've done a bit of work with it, but it was more designed to not just what they're looking at and what they see, but also listening to them as well. So that's another part of the game that we're 
that I haven't, I haven't got up here tonight to talk about is communication. But when they come out, a lot of them don't look forward, don't look up high. Their first movement is actually to look wide, just go there straight away. Um, sometimes they look up and you can see in the glasses that somebody's on. You think, give it, just give it. No, they hesitate a little bit, they don't give it, then it's shut down. Then they have to go to that safety ball. I call it the might ball for our percentages. So, what do you think the might ball is? What's the might ball? Hope ball. Hey? Hope ball. Hope ball, pretty much all hope ball, yeah. It might get there. Never mind. Players over there, and there's three opposition, but I'm still going to give it because it yeah. might get there. At 0.1 of a percent, it might get there. There's no bloody hope ball that's going to get there. But I'll still give it. <laughs> How do you stop them from doing that? Um, I don't know. Is anyone with the answer in here? I don't know. Again, it's, for me, it's just about you persevere with you. Keep working and working. We're showing them video. We're showing them their, their eye goggles and what they're looking at. We're showing them where they missed opportunities so that you sort of encourage them to look here, look here, it's on. Again, it's transparent in what they look at, uh, what you're working off the pitch, onto the pitch. Um, they can all see it, they can all identify it, they'll all tell you the answers that you want to hear. But actually getting guys to you know, make decisions on the field and making good decisions um, is quite difficult. And again, that's, that's an individual thing, decision making. Now, that's up to the individual. You can't, you can't make his mind up on the field. Uh, we're talking about T-Spot and YT. I know the T-Spot is something that came from the national program. I'm not sure about the YT, something Buddhist has talked about, um, the junior coach, national junior coach. Um, so T-Spot, everyone, everyone heard of the word T-Spot, which is um, edge of the circle and the back line, that junction there. We're talking, that's an area, I'm not saying get you right to that spot, we're talking about the sort of zone that we want people to, to lead there, that's an area of uh, where we can get good penetration, good attack. Yeah. Um, the white tee is out on the 25 on the sideline, so it's that junction there. So we're, we're, we're sort of asking if you want a player to be able to get there, but generally it's been strikers, striker of some sort, whichever striker, gets to the tee spot, to attack a midfielder to get out to the white tee, to that spot there. So the set areas to get to, and like I said, the areas are not right on that spot, it's, it's areas, but it's about maximizing the space and opportunity. Okay, but also question the opposition defence, stretching the opposition wide. It's a question of are they going to go and stand out there with you? Put them to the Yeah. So we're talking these sort of zones here at the T spots. I'm talking of white T spots there. So again, it, it depends on the formation you're playing, your structure up front. But you know, if, if the ball's on the uh, coming through this sort of zone here, you know, you might be asking one of your attacking midfielders to make the lead and get out to there. You know, it could be a striker's coming back to the ball through here, and it might be a striker that's way out here is making that lead there. So the player comes to here, he can feed that ball. When he gets the ball, his next pass might be this option down to here. So you're trying to stretch the opposition, you're trying to get depth and width in question. However, this guy can get the ball. It could be a defender that runs hard with that guy, but this 45 ball is on through here. Okay, so part of my rule with the guys is I want the options as soon as somebody gets the ball wide, we need an option down there, but also I think this ball here, this 45 ball is critical of somebody through there. Yeah, and that's a question of defenders. Can the free defender get in front and protect his, uh, his back guys so you can't give that 45 to very pass? Does that answer that? Yeah, yeah no, no. Do you have that, John? No, I'm right. You touched on it about the, you know, you're just creating, you, you're stretching the defence sideways, but you're elongating the defence, so have depth. it's very difficult to defend when you've got ball movement in front and you've got player movement at, the, at behind. If you have a combination of those, it's, then it's very difficult to defend. Um, and I, my own personal view is that's what's really India and Pakistan and teams like that have struggled, have struggled with. Historically, they've played a traditional, you know, five, five forward, you know, three strikers, two winners and stuff. So they've always had waves, if you've ever seen sort of a, way, a long way back about the Indians, Pakistan and on the subcontinent, 
running forward and throwing little through balls. Now there's no offside, now, there's, now the players can go there, but they don't have the ability to, rub, we call it rubber necking, where you're looking behind and defending at the same time. And I think that's where they've sort of dropped off the pace of recent years. That's, that's only my own view. Um, but they have dropped off the pace quite a bit you know, in the last, well, basically since that rule. I mean, as, as a defender, it's actually hard to defend as well from the point of view of you get isolated one-on-one -on -one with your man. So your one-on-one -on -one responsibility is, uh, yeah, is, is right there. You, you can't slip up because you haven't got the protection. Whereas if you don't have that elongation, like Jay said, you don't have the width and you keep the defenders compact together, then they can actually work off each other. You know, someone might be able to pop a ball in behind you, well, your next defender will step up and make an intercept. Well, they might eliminate you, but they're banged straight onto the next defender. But when you stretch, you're elongated, they're one on one, there's not as much protection in behind. So it gives you actually strikers more room to work with. And uh, I guess we like to say that in Australia, we've got fast, skillful strikers who will go one on one, have the ability to eliminate and penetrate the circle. Uh, the last one there is about rotations. We sort of talked about that. Um, touched over the defensive midfielders. Uh, it's about versatility, really. Defensive midfielders being able to rotate with an attacking midfielder. Uh, so it's not always getting stuck in the same spot. If you, if you just stay in the same areas and work in the same areas, uh, it's quite easy for an opposition to defend that and they don't have to work as hard. But if you've got players that are constantly moving and someone comes out of an area and goes forward, but then one of the uh, midfielders comes back in, attacking midfielders comes back in closer, you're moving your opposition, you're creating holes, you're questioning your opposition. Uh, so that's important to have. That's not as easy as it sounds to be able to do, to do that. Um, it's easy to say, oh, you need to do rotate with this guy, he's going to go out of here and come in. Getting into the middle of the field is quite difficult, and for them to learn that and actually sort of have the courage to do it. Sometimes they don't like doing it because they think they're going to do it, you know, it's going to be wrong. They're going to do something wrong and get in trouble for it. Um, I said defensive midfielders with attacking midfielders, attacking midfielders with strikers. I think in the national program you'll find that it could be a defensive midfielder, midfielder goes all the way from the fence, goes into attack, becomes a striker. Someone drops out and backs, backs him up and, uh, and covers for him until he can get back out. But he won't break the structure, he won't break the formation. Um, and they've just got the good versatility to be able to do that. <coughs> uh, you might have a defensive midfielder that drops out and creates a back four. So we talk about having three at the back. Sometimes, like I said, with our guys, we'll go to a back four. And it's up to the guys to be able to do it. They've got ownership um, out on the field to be able to instigate that. Uh, I'm happy for a defensive midfielder just to come out, whether he goes out wide, or whether he comes back out into a fullback position, and the guys all shuffle around and create a back four. So again, the questions of the opposition, some oppositions are going to pressure you, you go out and they're going to be pretty happy pressuring you, going, they play with the back three, we cover this, we cover that, we're right, then all of a sudden the fourth guy comes out and shit, we're not prepared for this. Okay, and how do they handle it? And again, being able to do that in the game, be able to mix and match, just, you get an idea of what's going to work for you in that game. Okay, it might, might be the back four works, so then you encourage the guys to stay with that. Then the opposition might change, you can go back to back three and start pushing it in other ways. Moving on without the ball, um, when we haven't, haven't got it, um, and I'll talk about being able to talk about pressing. Uh, some of the clips I'll show at the end, I've only got about five clips, but it's, it's more coming out of the back, so 16 yard hits. Okay, coming out of the back, about being able to press. Now, what are you trying to achieve in, in a press? You know, are you trying to push the ball to a certain area? Are you trying to win the ball right up there, there and then, in the, right in front of the press? Is it about putting pressure on the opposition? Is it about dropping weight, letting the opposition have the ball in that, in that back, back play and making them come to you? Okay. Where is the ball in relation to the, the field position? Yeah. Is it back in the defensive 25? Is it up closer to the centre line in the middle of the field? Yeah, is it deep defence out on the sideline? All those things are how do you press the opposition? So the third one, where are you wanting to win the ball? Where are you wanting to push the ball to? They're all sort of considerations you've got to take. So I know one of the presses that we do, um, we work on is, we don't want to win the ball up in attack. We'll press aggressively, and I like to be able to press aggressively. Depends on the opposition we're playing, a couple of oppositions we don't, we do a couple of different things. But generally we like to press aggressively, similar to what the Aussie guys do, the trend uh, they've set. 
but we want to win the ball back around the defensive side of the centre line. So our press is about getting the ball shifted to a certain position, closing the opposition down now, and then winning the ball. So it needs to draw it up. If the ball's here, we might set up something like, like this. Like that. The opposition is there. Something like that. We want to be able to clog this area up. We want them to force the ball to there. If we can. I don't mind if it goes that way. It doesn't matter to me if it goes left or right. I prefer it if we say we want it to go left as a general rule. Okay. But at the end of the day, is we want to leave the line so the ball just gets fired down there because when it goes there, this guy's out of this guy's face really quickly. So it's a winger who tucks infield, we want to press him out. Now as soon as that ball goes to the halfback, get out of his face, put him under as much pressure as you can straight away, do not get eliminated. Do not give away a soft free hit, just pressure him. Because more often than not, you pressure him and they just blindly throw the ball straight down the line. So we talked about the kind of roles and responsibilities of the players. Um, we talk about one of the responsibilities as a defender up here. It's not even an opposition player being there and a defender being there. And defending from behind, letting the guy get the ball. So if your press is right, I'm happy for a yeah, guy to be there, I want my guy there, in front. In touch, but in front, he knows that the player's there. So if I'm marking Jay, the ball's coming from up here, I don't want to be sitting back here and let Jay get in front of the ball and get the ball. I want to be standing up here in front of him. So if the ball comes, I can jump in front, make an intercept, make sure it hits the stick, goes over the sideline, so be it. You win some, you lose some. Preferably you want to stand in front, make the trap, go and get possession of the ball again. But the plan has always been, win it down here. If you can win it here, and they cough it up because of the pressure, great, even better. Uh, roles and responsibilities. Who and what numbers on the ball? Again, um, again, getting into some sort of technical stuff is if the opposition, it's identifying if the opposition is playing with a back three or a back four. If the opposition is playing with a back three, I'll use the centre of the field, it's easier. If they're playing with a back three, then we want our centre forward taking the mark. Okay, with our wingers sort of tucking in a little bit back here. And if they decide to play with the back four, and they're like that, they might go up there a little bit. Happy for this guy to fall away a little bit, protect this guy here. I'm happy for him to turn past the ball to there, that's fine. This guy comes around into this zone here, protects there. He's watching this guy, but holding infield a little bit. Okay, slowly puts pressure on this squeeze of this guy. Everybody else is coming across the field. Everybody's squeezing up. So again, that's something that I work on with, with the guys. Uh, that's if they've got a, a back forward. It's different again if the ball... Again, I want to ask you guys a question to see if you're... If there's a hit, over this side, this guy's got the ball here, sorry, the defender's there, other defender's there, there's the ball. Who do you think needs to take the mark here? Who needs to take the ball? The outside striker. The outside striker? Yeah. Who thinks the outside striker? Hey? Yeah, You've got the centre striker needs to take this one. Yeah. Okay. So the outside striker there, the centre striker here. Yeah. Right winger, say there. Jay, what are you doing? I'm just scared to put it in the spot. What's that sound for? 
Because no right or wrong answer. <laughs> it's quite simple. I don't think so. If it's me, if it's me, I'll put the, um, the winger there. I'll have the centre striker there and the winger in here. I'll deny the ball going back once it's out that side. I'll say you can only come down the right. So this guy here, he won't stand to it. He'll be pretty much in front preventing that. But sometimes that's not going to happen. <clears throat> sometimes you're going to have your centre striker there and you're going to have this winger sitting back in here and you allow them to come out around the back. It's going to happen. The right think there's a right or wrong with it. Because some teams do it different ways. But it's just interesting to see what, what people think. So some people, like I said, they go to the centre. Some will go with the outside. Ray, why would you go with the outside? Well, I don't think you need to get the ball, as you say. You want them to do something with it. And yep. I reckon if you watch what, I suppose, soccer players and all the rest do, they always keep playing the switch. So it, it gets it out of defence, obviously. But, I mean, it's where you want to get the ball. So why knack them all forwards, having them out of position, keep them in their position, sort of in the rough area, so they're not having to do too much running, because they're probably the, you know, the guys who are most running, so keep them in the area where they need to be, and make the ball go out, or try and pressure, as you say, to even use the sidelines, get it to the team, you the sideline. This person, if this is the case, has a pretty important role to play, because they're only five yards off the ball, if they've got a poor line, the ball can easily get smacked straight through them, and what protection have they got behind is one thing. You don't know what your inside forward's doing, you've got an inside forward probably marking the opposition. You will have a free player back near the centre line somewhere, which we'll come to in a second. Okay. If you've got your centre forward that comes in here, takes it, and your winger steps back a little bit, you've got that little bit of protection. You're questioning them to be able to bang it through their area, but you're leaving this exposed, unless this guy can sort of come across here a little bit. Helps protect that. I suppose tactically, if, you, if you're if you're going up on a left, left defender or left half, is uh, is assessed as being a weakness. Yeah. You'd want to push that. Forward. Yeah, and again, I think it's assessing your opposition. Um, but if you see a way that you want to do it and it's going to work, then I think it's fine. I'm saying I don't think there's a right or wrong. Um, we'll see some clips in a minute of how. <coughs> Our, um, I guess the Aussies do it. Uh, we have a thing with at the back and they stand on the sideline. An extra defender back. No, no, it's still three, but yeah, that circle on the sideline. So they need to two. Yeah, up here. Yeah, up this way. Yep. I think it becomes nearly good for that, that striker then to defend there. This one here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's yes. why I would, I would bring the centre guy to that position and then have the other guy fall out. Back here, yep. yeah. Yeah. This, which player is this, Jay? Just, is this an, an attacking midfielder or is this a... Uh, no, no, again, a defender midfielder. Defender midfielder, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it goes there and then another defender midfielder yeah. really. So if you've got a centre forward, yeah, roughly there, yeah. encouraging, that's not available, so encouraging passes back, then the centre yeah. forward could run a C curve, that's and then you've got a mobile press to the to the defence on. Yep. So it's like, all under pressure. It's similar to when the ball was in the middle, it was here. Yeah. You're saying we have a centre, and you've got a... You've got your winger who drops back here. They play the ball to this guy, and again, he comes out there. It's a C curve where you get in between them so that they can't come back. So you're actually pushing them to the side that they've gone to. Okay, This guy here just puts pressure on them, forces this guy to have to make the play. This guy just keeps falling away, doesn't need that option. Okay, You've got maybe another guy comes in here, but then he's followed by another opposition player in there. Like that's a centre half and defensive mid, but you're asking him to actually force the ball. Make the play under pressure. It's quite difficult to do. Uh, move on. Um, we talk about marking positions. Um, well, first of all, distance distances from the ball. Um, we talk about being five yards from the ball, fifteen yards. So, and we're talking about aggressive presses, pressing right up. But you might get yelled. Um, you might play an opposition that are actually quite happy to play against an aggressive press and that can yank yeah, build the ball, you've got guys in the back and hit a good ball, you've got Jay Stacey back there to smack the ball through over Okay, maybe not. But you might fall away. Me personally, I think Australians are notorious for being uh, 
not liking the uh, oppositions that fall away, where we've got a lot of space at the back and we're asked to yeah, bring it up to us. We've got to carry it up to the line and then we've been asked to make the play. We, quite, we find that quite difficult. Um, so it might be times where you fall away. But if you're pressing aggressively, aggressively you want your player five yards, right on the players. You, you want them pushing the boundaries so the umpire saying, no, no, back a couple of steps, back a couple of steps. Okay, once that umpire's happy with it, as soon as that ball's been touched, man, get in there, put pressure on the ball straight away. Again, it comes back to, I think, defend, uh, attackers need to know how to tackle, as well as defenders. Because they're rushing in there, getting eliminated easily. We're giving away a cheat for a hit, because it's a good opportunity, as soon as that ball's been touched, to get in there and actually win a ball uh, in attack. Uh, marking positions, we talk about, uh, they use a, a term I fit. Okay, so I fit meaning in front, in touch. So again, like I say about marking J, not marking from behind, okay, where the opposition can get the ball easily, <coughs> and they can turn and do whatever, and they have possession of it. It's actually being able to step in front of them, but still in touch, still feels in there. So it's, it's me, and depending on where you are on the field. Now I can mark Jay from this distance when the ball's 50 yards away. I'm comfortable with that. If it's a bit closer, then I want to be here, but I still want to be in front of him, but I can still touch, I still feel him there. Okay, but also position myself so that I can see him and the ball. Too many guys will come and mark, I'll do this, I'll go like that, oh, he's there, as soon as I do that, he leads here. The ball gets put in there, that hole there. So it's being in a position where, yeah, I can see Jay, I can see the ball over there as well. He wants to make that lead, I see him go, I can either step and block him, and turn and go with him. But to get him, get him the ball, they're going to have to come through me first. Just, just with the positioning of the mark, <coughs> the positioning of the mark is at the back of it, if you're full, full pressing or, or whatever you want to do, though that positioning is just as critical as the guys at the front and their positioning because they're the ones that actually win the ball. Very rarely the ones at the front will win the ball. So you can imagine if you're fully, fully pressing and the striker going, yeah, we've done a great job, I'll put pressure on this guy, put his head down and he whacked it out, then you turn around and the defenders are standing behind him and that's an easy outlet for them. There's, so that positioning at the back is, yeah, you might think, oh, fair way, I'm 50 or 60 metres away from the ball. It's probably not, not as critical or crucial, but it is critical that everyone's in the correct position. So if the, if the strikers and, and people up the front are doing their, their role and putting pressure on and referred pressure so those, those defenders whack the ball out, it's equally critical that the guys at the back are marking in front to make that interception. Otherwise, there's no point putting pressure on the front. You're wasting your, wasting your energy up the front. Could you expand on the concept of referred pressure? Um, Yes, referred pressure is perhaps at a free at a free hit, um, and we've got a there's a working the mark. There's a big difference if a player is standing in front and he's going, I'm going to intercept this if he's anywhere near me, or to this, and you'll see the guys down low, um, all the guys in the national team, you can see it all the way through. But that puts that referred pressure back on without the ball even even taken. So he's already going, oh, I've got to get this moving because this guy's like looking me right in the eyes. Then that pressure builds back into the next line as well. That, that's why I call it work, working mark. It used to be, it used to be standing the mark was the term. But then they check because they'll go into the video, the video on debriefing match and now yeah, I was standing the mark and it was there, but there was nothing really happening. It wasn't really. It just gives the, the person striking the ball, taking the taking the free. The, the feeling that they could pass the ball anywhere down here without being intercepted, whereas down a bit low and looking and, and being a bit active and working the mark, it just puts that preferred pressure onto that person taking the, taking the stoppage. Working the mark might also be, it's not necessarily always the guy on the ball as well. Yeah, you know, we talk about this guy here, he's got a ball. You've got a defender in front of him. This guy here is working the mark sideways. Like Jay said, he's, he's moving here and saying, no, you're not coming here. I'm going to look back there and I'm coming here. If you've got a player out here, it might also be this player. He's working the mark. So <coughs> this player looks like he's going to go there. He looks like he's going to go and cover it. Okay, if he's looking through this area here, he's looking to cover inside. So, now it's me. I'm covering the inside, yeah. Oh, you're going to go outside. You're going over here as well. So you've got the guy on the ball 
indecisive. He's not quite sure. Shit knows if it's covered. Oh, I'm looking at it. No, it's not, it's not good. A classic. I think one of the most important positions on the field is the next one, the sweeper position. Okay, and, and the role that the person plays. So we've talked about some things uh, earlier, um, what this person does and who, who needs to sort of cut off certain balls, but the sweep position is as critical, that being able to protect the back three. So a sweep position is generally going to be, it's like the old school up fullback. Up fullback is free, helps protect the three guys who are marking the three opposition strikers. Nowadays it's a defensive midfielder. One of the defensive midfielders pushes out, becomes like an old school centre half and pushes up on the opposition uh, centre half. Okay, the other defensive midfielder, he acts as the up fullback and stays back a bit more defensively. So, when everything's happening, when everything's happening through this area here and all their players are in here pressing and that, okay, if you've got the ball here, in the middle, generally you'll find, probably around the centre line somewhere, might even be on the defensive side of the centre line, don't know, you're going to find hopefully the sweeper. And he's going to cover that line between the ball and your goal box down here, which they call the hot line. It's hot line, okay, is where the ball is on the field to the goal box as a general rule. Sometimes it might always happen like that. You may have to be, you may get called on to mark somebody, and you may have four guys in the back marking. But generally, this guy here, he just sweeps across side to side as the ball gets shifted. He goes there, he's coming across here. Stays free and helps protect that zone. So the oppositions can't fire the balls direct back here to their strikers. See, you like to think this defender here is the general, he's talking to your sweeper, setting the sweeper up. So it's about covering the hotline. Particularly when opposition's coming, they've got three hits around the 25, just outside the 25, when it's pretty dangerous when they can carry it in and they can bang it into the circle. And teams that have got guys that have got a lot of power, okay, and a nice flat safety pass, they'll look to penetrate the circle from out there. Okay, you need to position your sweeper. The sweeper needs to be positioned really early. You need to identify who's your free player, who is the sweeper. The person needs to get into position early, Cut that ball, cut that direct line to goals. Right. I think that's pretty much the, the chit chat side. Um, I just want to do some, um, there's a couple of clips. So there's a couple of clips here. There's a couple of Queen, there's from Queensland, just a training, training in Queensland. Um, a couple of things that we did. Just about yeah, one team, the yellow team is sort of an older group. The, the maroon team is, is the 21s guys pretty much out here. This was sort of about maybe eight weeks ago. Um, and the yellow guys is just doing different things coming out of the back, sort of trying to question the, uh, the younger 21s group. And uh, this was the first night we did it. Um, and it was, He's playing with a back three, so a guy on the ball. Um, you have a defensive midfielder in here. You yeah, still have your back three, you can't see them. They've spaced themselves well. Um, and then it was just playing straight down the middle. So you have a centre striker there, you have one of the outsides, and you have another guy here. Um, attacking midfielders have come into the middle. Okay, so I'll play it through. Um, you can have a look at it. There's only a couple of clips here, four clips, I think. But just how easy it was to, to actually get out. So behind this, we're talking about questioning this guy here. His man's coming to the middle here, his man's there. Well, does he come all the way and, and go there? If he does go there, Leaves a big hole through here for one of these guys to lead into, whether it be that guy or this guy. Um, you've got our, we talked about our strikers being tucked in a little bit, we're allowing the ball to the outside. The, the 21 guys, they're not really, they don't understand what the opposition are doing here, they haven't really uh, identified that the opposition are coming in. So when it all happens, it's quite easy to go over the top into space. So this guy receiving the ball here is a defender. 
So we talk about that ability and adaptation to be able to go forward and uh, rotate into different lines. Good example here. So a defender now going into attack. This lead here, heading out to the, the wide tee, is important. Now the defender, this movement here, we're actually cutting in on the, on the 45 is, is quite critical. Okay, because it's held the defender up. It's given this guy an opportunity to get to space. That's something we haven't really touched on. Um, we talk about passing to the left foot. Um, this has become a big thing from uh, Mr. Paul Lissick, our German consultant with the National Colonel. Um, he's really big on with the, uh, his information and knowledge of the German style about bringing uh, some of their traits uh, to Australia is about passing down the left foot. So a perfect example of being able to just slip the ball as easy as flat down the left foot of the defender. You can't get there. So it's quite simple. It looks a bit messy. They made it messy, but in the end, just a one simple one-two. If you look at this, they've done all the hard work to get to to the end. They've got one pass to make, and again, it's the left foot again. Imagine if you just threw this ball through here on this guy's left foot. You've got this guy here, you've got this guy on the post, you've got this guy here. I think he'd just get him and cream it anyway, I hope he would. Okay. And then you've got the support, this guy running in, this guy running in. And you've got all the defenders just watching the ball. Again, the second one, this is just an example of the same game, just a different outlet coming back, same position I guess, you know, people could, but another simple way of getting up. So it's just a simple two on one. Here's the next play to the attacking midfielder. And again, made things quite difficult, we didn't have to, so again, it gets to here. This guy here has come from the opposite side of the field. <coughs> so he's actually made a long lateral lead, not a short lead, not a five, he's made a good 40, 40 yard lead. His man's out here somewhere, they've let him go. Well, that's his man there, and this other guy who come across now, got, he's got three of his opposition play, and he needs three or four yards, it's enough. But again, it's just a simple skill error, right? it's letting down. So the pass is there. How do you just receive that? Instead of trying to first time it received it and knocked it into here, this guy would pick it up and hopefully it would be running at this defender here. This player would be ghosting away out here. Okay, it's a two on one with this last defender. That's easy to watch on the tape and go, geez, why didn't they do that? And there you see it so. <laughs> So this was just from Queensland, I threw in a couple of things. This is a recent series uh, earlier this year in uh, January, February in uh, Perth, Australia versus Holland. So this is the Aussies coming out. So we're looking at the Aussies coming out, but also more or less the pressing of the Dutch, how the Dutch press. And the work rate off the ball. And they win the ball back. So again, it's looking at who takes the ball here. Well, he, he's your centre striker. I'm assuming there's the winger. Okay, but it's the work rate for this guy to race across. It's this guy coming across. Okay, here's the sweeper, the critical man here. He's just by himself. He's just protecting that space so that the Aussies can't go direct. Again, the skill error out on the receive. That's got it. Now it's not, but this is the Aussies pressing. So again, pushing the five. Who takes the ball? There's the centre man comes over. And again, we win the ball and they shift it. So I go back to that one, I was either the centre guys. This I one think one. I don't know who's there, who's on. This one here? No, uh, uh, up the front, the striker. What? Left? Yeah, that one there. Um, Daddy or Junior or someone? Matt goes on there. No, okay. But that positioning there, he can only overhead it down the line. His positioning there is protecting, because he's close to the ball, he's protecting an overhead on the angle. <coughs> so that allows the rest of the Australian guys to slide across the field. Because that, 
So the guys on that side, if they get him in the correct position, then they know that they can't. So I think it might be that might be Devo there, is it? So this is Devo. Oh, that's Devo there. Sorry. That's Devo there. Um, that looks like Simon Orchard there. Simpson, Glenn Simpson there, maybe. Yeah, no, that's it. But those guys on the right hand side, the, the national, <coughs> our national guys. But that's that's protected there. If you pass it back to the guy, the Dutch guy in the circle, then he'll just run a C curve, and they'll end up pushing it to the left half. But they're happy with them throwing it up into into a small space because obviously if they if they try to play in a small space and we've got a full contingent of defence, it's much harder for them to penetrate us than, and more, more times on up will win the ball. Had this guy stayed out, this guy come in and marked, like we said, the, the outside guy, which I don't know, some teams might may do that. This guy will get it, he'd have a two on one with the outside guy here. They limit that guy two on one, he'd probably come with this guy. Two and one with this guy. Might have these guys posting up through here. Also, it would be, would be simple, basic hockey uh, for the Dutch to get out and break the press. And again, so that that there just highlighting uh, the importance of the sweeper role. Reading the game comes across, makes the intercept. We win possession. And if you notice, the shift it was to get the ball possession, shift it in the middle, they're looking to get to the other side straight away. So that's what we want to do. We want to concentrate on winning the ball like that from an overhead. We don't want to go back into where all the numbers are, where the ball's just come out of. All the space is going to be on the opposite side of the field. So if we can get it, shift it through the middle to the other side, the help side, um, that's what we want to do. Um, this is just, I put this in here, this is just so everyone knows. Um, <laughs> Jezza Edwards, just a, a clip when we're, uh, this is from Joe Hall last year, the, the junior national trip to Malaysia. Uh, this is in the final against Malaysia. Um, I won't put the volume on because we've got Paul Goyne yelling and screaming and swearing, um, so we won't have that. But uh, I was going to be a bit embarrassing if I told him that, he, that Johnny's putting it on tape. So. Um, but this is about <laughs> a bit of patience coming out of the back. Okay, but just giving a couple of simple passes, but it's also the ability of somebody to break the line. It's about using speed, a recognition of space, okay, and at the end of it getting a reward. So this is this is Jezza here. So in Malaysians are actually really quick, but he made them look pretty slow by busting through there. But again, what allowed him to come through this area, I think, is also this guy getting questioned here because he's been drawn out. This is an attacking midfielder who's wide. He's created this hole here. So when you look at it, he had a couple, you know, he's gone A1 straight through the middle to this guy. Okay? He also got this guy, he could have slipped it down the left foot again to this guy on the top of the circle. But also got these options, guys getting to the back face. So, you know, I just thought if we put on this, just roll Tazzy going. Just roll it back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Further? Oh, I did. Yeah, just go again. Yeah, just roll. You can see him, he's having a little look over his shoulder. He, he sees his guy coming in, but he knows he's got a bit of space in behind. And maybe about now, yeah. You got that, I think it's going to be the goal scorer who's up the front there. Is that going to be the goal scorer? I actually don't know, I don't think so. That looks like Beal. My point's going to be that because Jez is running so so quickly, he's, in, he's engaged the defenders at the, at the back and sort of held one up. At some point in time, you can see that the, the whole attention of the defender, the Malaysian guy, goes onto the ball carrier and that allows that guy to slip away and, and become free, free in the middle of the circle. You're right, it is a goal scorer. Yeah, he just now his attention's all on the ball. He's got no idea where that player's gone, and he's just he's just snuck in behind him, straight down his left foot. As you, you can also see, that, like we talked about the importance of getting that width. So we had this guy early making the space, coming to the space out here, drawing the defender. Does he come? Does he stay? We've got these guys also getting higher into the sort of almost to the far post option, but. Trying to question these two defenders, they, they, they're bringing them away, they're creating this little hole, it's triangle. He's just in the middle of a triangle, so he hasn't got a lot of space, okay? but it's enough. It's enough to score. It's enough to score. So he only needs 
three yards, not even three yards, I don't even, there's two yards of space there, there's probably two or three there. That's all he needs. Enough to be able to get a touch to control the ball. Second touch is a shot on goal. Matthew, would that uh, wide, wide midfielder for Malaysia have been better off to actually perhaps come in and challenge Jezza earlier and, and leave the wide pass open? To this guy here? Yeah. I'll, if it's me, yeah, I'm always with the belief that you don't want the ball coming through these areas. So if, if his defence felt that they were going to be threatened, and the space, if it was me, I'd probably be saying, yeah, come in, field, come in, field, make him go to that guy on the other side. And then just to buy yourself some more time in the defence to try and get numbers back, get these guys back, get this guy up here across so that you can actually, you can secure the play a little bit more. So if that was me, yeah. You also cause the opposition to pass the ball more times, so it just gives you a little bit more time in that, that aspect as well. And also, there's also extra chances of error and things like that. But in Australia, we like to be able to Break the lines, break the oppositions. We like to be able to run fast, run past oppositions and create attack. I mean, to me, this is a this is a great play. Okay, and, and this is what we're after. Players that can have the ability to be able to do this. Um, as you can see, yeah, you know, ten seconds before this, we we're in defence. Ten seconds later, we're scoring a goal. And it happens quite quick. Um, that's that's the end of um, Royce, the, the talking stuff. Uh, from the presentation side, um, probably an opportunity just to open it up to some questions to finish off with tonight. It doesn't have to be related to anything we've spoken about tonight. It could be about any, anything that you guys uh, want to know more about. You talk about attacking and defensive midfielders and whether they play left or right. What principles of play, say you take the Queensland team or down 21, but what principles of play do you have? You know, you have all of them. Or you, you mid balls over on one side of the pitch, or you, there must be certain principles of play with, with certain structures. <coughs> well, we, we play with, um, we actually play the 21s, play a little bit differently to, to how I play. Um, they'll play with two up front and two strikers, and they'll have three three midfielders. Um, so it's a little bit different with, with them. Right. But um, yeah, if it's me, I think you're, you're looking at. It may change from game to game. You may vary what you want your, your midfielders to do. You may vary what your defensive midfielders do, depending on your opposition. And then you have a look at the way your opposition press and where they position their players. And you're looking for opportunities where you can you can uh, question your opposition. Where you think, well, we need to be able to shift them. They're quite, quite strong here. They're quite compact. We need to space them out. We need to question them by you know, drawing players. It might be, you might ask one of your attacking midfielders to actually start out on the line. And it might be around the centre line, junction of the centre line and the sideline. You might ask them, that's a starting position. Try and get out there, see if you, you can draw an draw a opposition player with you. Um, but you might also ask for one of your defensive midfielders to roll out wide and, and go out and create maybe a back four. But the hole they leave is one of your attacking midfielders to come back into. Um, so what, why I say it's important to be able to rotate and move around, not get caught in one position. If you watch a lot of guys, They'll, they'll set up on a 16, they'll go and find their spot, they'll lean on the stick and have a bit of a look, go then they might start walking. And they think that's moving and shifting. It's but too do, slow. But do you have left midfielders mid who essentially play left or right no. midfielders who essentially play no. right? I don't have left or right. Okay, so in some ways that's following the trends of the, mm. the national program. Okay, I've said to all the boys, they need to be versatile. So when we train, I don't say you're left, you're right, you're a defender. You're a defensive midfielder, you're an attacking midfielder, uh, they go and mix it around. <coughs> so they'll play the whole variety, they'll play left and right, they'll play centre, um, and that's just to give them the other the expectation of the players coming through as much as singers, but can run. What are some of the strategies that the other 